So with this in mind, uh, I wanted to introduce the panel that will deep dive on some of the subjects that, that I've outlined here. We, we couldn't have imagined uh, a more representative audience uh, and, and panel uh, in this particular panel to speak about the well-functioning market. We have leaders from the largest European railway and mobility uh, organizations. And if I may start to introduce the panelists and hopefully they are coming up on the stage. Meanwhile, I remind everyone uh, that you can pose your questions uh, on, the, on the Slido platform, but I wanted to introduce the, uh, the first panel to discuss the, uh, the well-functioning market development uh, and, of course, something that focuses both on maximizing traffic and maximizing socioeconomic benefits. So first, we have uh, Bente Yedema joining us from the uh, European Rail Infrastructure Managers. Hi, Bente. Then we have Marina uh, Pop, uh, Popapidou from uh, CER, which is the community of uh, European railway and infrastructure companies. We have Nick Brooks uh, from All Rail, which is the alliance uh, for uh, rail new entrants. Uh, we have Connor Feehan who is the uh, Secretary General of European Rail Freight Association. We have uh, Simon Fletcher, who is the uh, Chief of Europe uh, for uh, UIC. We have Janis Zvigulis, uh, who is the head of the Transport Working Group of the Foreign Investors Council here in Latvia, but representing very much the entire Baltic investment community. And handing over, it is my great pleasure uh, to hand over to our uh, moderator for this session, the one and only Catherine Troutman, who is the European coordinator for the North Sea Baltic 10T corridor. Catherine, take us away. Thank you very much, Kaspars. I'm so glad to, to uh, have a discussion with uh, such a competent uh, panel, and uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, your contribution will be of major importance for the understanding of what we must do and can do uh, to obtain all the, the results which was uh, expressed by Kaspars uh, when we speak of what we wait for. When we listen to um, the the seminar, the part of the uh, of the uh, of the day uh, on tenders, we could see that the phases of construction is a uh, very uh, important in economy, local, regional, national, international economy. When you invent, you invest somewhere, you you give also a part of attractivity, a part of uh, added value. It is in fact in business in. Uh, in benefits uh, and in job creation. So it is very important. Uh, the second um, remark I want to express is that Rail Baltica is about linking people and linking businesses. It is a way to reinforce the capacities of different national markets to merge together and to give with this infrastructure uh, new possibilities of um, for econ our economy. It is also, and, um, and Kaspars insisted at the end of his speech uh, on that, it's, um, we, we saw complexity about, uh, about Rail Baltica, but we see also how this project of infrastructure and this train with new services is a way to um, use and to put in common uh, capacities and competences of innovation. For the Commission, of course, uh, looking for corridors as economical corridors, for me as coordinator, looking on the uh, North Sea Baltic uh, to be an accelerator for climate change, for transition, of course, energy questions, digital aspects are keys for this acceleration. But of course, now we want to listen to you. To, to understand how you see and what you, you preconize uh, for the success of this infrastructure from your eyes, from your organization. And of course, at first, I will ask Bente Yedema uh, to, with uh, this um, first question, uh, I would be interested to know what in your experience needs to be done to make this railway line a success. What do you see as the most important conditions that needs to be fulfilled? And what is particularly important, especially here uh, in the Baltics, when setting, setting up such a greenfield uh, project? The question will be the same to all the panelists. 
in a second period of, of our discussion, I will ask you to react and comment to have uh, an interactive, uh, um, you know, uh, moment and not just a succession of, uh, of uh, answers. So, Bente, if you, if you agree. Yes, thank you, Catherine, and thank you all for having me on this event. Uh, it's very exciting to have seen today uh, what Real Baltica's actually making possible. And um, one of the key re pre sorry, pre pre prerequisites, sorry, that's a difficult English word. <laughs> In my view, it's competition. And to have competition, you will need uh, several railway undertakings, not just one, but more than one. Uh, and this will lead to better value and an efficient and effective use of the railway infrastructure. And in order to facilitate this, we definitely need market opening. And I have seen that you see Real Botka as a European uh, project, which is very good to hear. Um, so yeah, the main thing for me is market opening, competition. This is all really very important in this stage and in future stages as well. Um, it will be a very, very good um, chance and a unique chance for Real Baltica to really invest in competition and opening up the market. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bente. Um, this is an introduction and an answer also uh, to what Caspar uh, said before. We mm -hmm. are in a, in a new step uh, and uh, we have a sort of a scaling of uh, the uh, open opening of the, uh, of the rail market now with the new uh, uh, regulatory uh, framework. So it is also um, taken in mind by several uh, organizations. So I will ask Marina uh, Potapidou, uh, who works a lot uh, with the um, uh, European Rail Agency. Uh, what uh, does she think for, the, uh, for her recommendations for the best success for, for Rebeltica, please? Thank you very much, Catherine, and thank you to all uh, to be also uh, today present in this very exciting uh, panel. Uh, of course, I agree to what uh, Bente said, competition and market opening is a prerequisite, one of the many actually prerequisites um, for, for, uh, for successful uh, international rail services, including the uh, market opening and open access, so to bring down all the uh, barriers down. But of course, I would like to start with infrastructure. Uh, digitalized, connected and resilient infrastructure is, is the key and we should start always there to uh, continue providing uh, the services. So the completion of the 10T core networks uh, and the uh, deployment of uh, infrastructure technical requirements, including uh, the deployment of ERTMS uh, on board and on track is, is one of the key uh, priorities to us. Uh, that being said, uh, to, to, uh, for the competition, uh, we also need a competition, at least a transparent and fair competition with other transport modes. So the creation of a level playing field for all transport modes, uh, for instance, by abolition of VAT and international train tickets in all member states, and equal treatment in energy taxation uh, is, is really a must. So we can uh, continue uh, providing su successful and efficient international uh, rail passenger and freight services. Thank you very much uh, for these two aspects. Uh, the, uh, the playing field, uh, which must be uh, equal, and fair for, for all the modes, but also uh, for digitalization. Of course, we see if we want to have um, this prerequisite uh, as a good uh, uh, context for, for this uh, realization and with a good market, if I can say in an economical point of view, uh, we need uh, uh, the conditions uh, Marina, you spoke about. So it is, um, it is um, I think, very nice to listen, uh, Nick Brooks, because uh, you are you represent new entrants and uh, of course uh, it is feasible if the market is open no <laughs> what do you think yes that's right and and catherine um, thanks for having me here today and and i can only uh, agree with the two previous panelists about their their uh, recommendation to have more competition i mean certainly with other green field high speed networks in the past and there haven't been too many 
But one that I'd like to highlight is Italy, uh, which was built a couple of t almost two decades ago. And soon afterwards, there was competition on the tracks between different high speed operators. Okay. And it's caused that market to double in the last seven years um, before the pandemic. So surely that can be applied to the Baltic model as well, considering that the major cities along the line, um, such as Vilnius, are easily big enough, we think, to sustain a commercially viable passenger traffic between rail passenger traffic. To on, along the whole line. Um, I mean, we say the minimum size of a city has to be 100,000, and a lot of the cities are higher than that. And uh, so we think that the first uh, default must be to see if um, a, a market can be achieved without any kind of subsidy, to see if they're a commercially viable market is possible. And only after that has been um, identified through some kind of market analysis um, if uh, to see if market players can do the job only if that fails then we look at other options such as some form of public service offering but the default must be a competitive um, system where there's more than one operator because we see that that is what really brings the growth in passenger rail and in finding the right mechanisms to achieve that kind of market the right kind of market conditions that's an important priority but from all, all that Kaspar said in his speech earlier on it sounds like this is the ideal kind of fledging innovative economy that the European single market should be trying to achieve. And um, I certainly our, our members look forward to be part to being part of that in the future. Thank you, uh, Nick. Uh, I agree with you. And uh, I think that Red Baltica can be an experience, a European experience for what we have to do. That's why it is very important that we can also associate organizations, uh, you know, uh, companies, citizens uh, to, to to uh, merge, uh, to, to converge, uh, to see and understand and contribute to the project. This is very important. This will be also, uh, for me, uh, as I see it, a sort of um, source of success. Uh, I had the experience of building, uh, it was not me, but uh, supporting a new uh, high-speed uh, line. And of course, the idea was to associate the people, the passengers and companies at the beginning of the process so that they could understand uh, the added value of this infrastructure. So this is also very important for uh, the, uh, uh, all the um, challenges uh, of uh, the, the rail freight also, not only for passengers. So come off again, uh, you, you are concerned very much by this uh, freight aspect. So what do you have to say? Correct. Thanks, Catherine. So as Casper said earlier, this is fundamentally about linking people and businesses. When it comes to businesses, it's about giving businesses control over the supply chains who they can choose to work with. And this is achieved through competition. When we look at the rail freight market across Europe, this has been a positive story in rail freight normally. Now competitors account for on average 48% of national markets. If we look at the largest rail freight market in Europe, Germany, competitors now account for 57% of that market. The Baltic states, I have to say, continue to be a bit of an outlier. So we need to be seeing how we can use Rail Baltica to that's a speed start that competition in this region. Just to give an example, in Latvia today, the incumbent operator is 70% of the market, in Estonia, 98%, in Lithuania, 100% of the market. So there's a lot of work to be done in competition in this region. So we need to be seeing how can Rail Baltica be used to increase competition. And like I said, put the businesses at the forefront of supply chains. Thank you uh, for these remarks. They are very wise. And uh, I think that uh, uh, we see uh, that there is a special situation and a special context in this country. So we have to move uh, smoothly uh, to, uh, uh, to better, uh, better competition, better situation. As coordinator, I'm very, very uh, uh, cautious about this uh, question. And I listen very much to what you said. And uh, I see that the process is ongoing. So we have with us Simon, um, a very uh, wise person, <laughs> if I can say, because he works on different level and with uh, his organization, uh, he sees the big picture, but also, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the concrete, uh, the concrete um, mode of rage. So what do you think today, uh, Simon, uh, about what can be done? 
There's nothing like bigging up the bigging up the issue. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, <laughs> why is I don't know. Will you, you can be the judge of that um, after the event. Um, thank you very much um, for for the introduction, and indeed, thank you very much uh, to Caspers and the team for for putting this event on because I think it's a it's a very very positive a uh, very positive step um, and. Um, looking from where we are at um, um, uh, outside of the Balkan area, uh, the Baltic states rather, uh, is uh, that we have a. Um, I think we can be we can be quietly jealous. I have to say, um, of the project that um, that Rail Baltica has brought into, brought onto the stage, as it were, because it, being able to build uh, a brand new railway from nothing um, is a dream for very many people. Uh, and it is something which I was lucky to do with Eurostar because I was there right at the very beginning of Eurostar in, in the early 90s. And whilst that wasn't necessarily green field, it was certainly cutting edge. And I think one of the things that we learned as a result of that is, as you've just said, Catherine, and others have echoed, there is, there is only one reason for building a railway um, and running trains, and that is to carry people and goods from A to B, uh, wherever A and B are, it doesn't matter. Uh, and that is something which we need to keep very much in mind. And, and that, is why, that is why it's very important that we are thinking about what will the added benefits of be, or be of having this, this railway uh, running through um, this um, space that has been occupied by other people up until now. And those people are going to be perhaps slightly um, uh, jealous or indeed angry um, um, at the at the fact that the railway is cutting through great swathes of, of of the land which they have come to appreciate, and we can see that happening as well uh, with HS2 in the UK, uh, and it's something which we need to uh, we need to make sure that we are, in terms of bringing the people on board, it that is so so important because they need to understand uh, the uh, and we will talk later about about um, costs and 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 that sort of thing, the economics of it all. But it, we need, they need to understand the added value that this is going to bring and what it's going to do to their daily lives, how it's going to de declutter uh, the city centre, because with, with, a, with the following wind and a level playing field, we will be able to keep people out of cars and off the roads and onto trains, which means that there is less, less congestion in the city centres um, as people travel from and less congestion on the roads because people are travelling by train. Uh, from A to B, rather than going by car, which is probably the prevalent form of transport um, today. And so it, it, is, it is hugely important in my mind uh, that we have, that there is a, a very, very strong outreach program to the people who not only the community will serve, but the people in the hinterland of the, of the, of the, um, of the, of the service as well. So that the people who are at the extremities of it, um, understand that there is going to be this new facility, which people, which they will be able to use um, in the fullness of time. Yes, thank you. Appropriation of uh, of this uh, of this tool uh, for their mobility and integrate it uh, with their urban mobility systems. Uh, very efficient. This is also a key. So, uh, Yanis, uh, you are at the forefront of the companies and the economical partners. So you are not an observer. You are really a partner. So how do you see your role and, uh, and the, the contribution of uh, your association, your organization for, for the, the success of uh, Red Baltica? Oh, thank you very much, Catherine, for the for the for the post question. Thank you very much for having me here today. We, as uh, for investors council, are so to say very pleased to see large scale projects with potential high social economic uh, development, which poses a lot of possibilities. But at the same time, there are obviously some questions that need to be answered, and some of the questions that uh, I would like to. Uh, see uh, tackled in the course of time. Uh, first of all, we speak of, oh, usually about governance, about leadership in, in, in such a large scale projects as uh, this one. Since this is a multi-country <coughs> project with quite difficult operational models and which also sometimes can get a bit political. So to say, so this is a, so, so this is one of the issues we would certainly like to see tackled and clearly answered. And then, uh, as I was already mentioned by a few other panelists, we obviously look about at the market need, uh, i.e. answering the infamous question of why, why this project is here, 
uh, how will it <coughs> benefit the stakeholders, both those that will be using the service and those that will be affected by the service in one way or the other. And uh, so basically we are looking at better understanding the soundness of the business model because we have kind of used to this west-east uh, corridor, but not that much at the uh, north-south corridor. So this is quite a novelty for, for us and also for the investor community, obviously. So we are positively looking at understanding it and, uh, and, and trying to see what could be the collaboration points for the, for the investment community. And as was already mentioned, we'll, we'll not repeat too much, uh, fair competition is crucial. And, and obviously, uh, thinking out of infrastructure in terms of its longevity, uh, longevity, as well as interoperability is also key questions that we have been tackling in uh, our council in other fronts, but uh, we will probably be have to look at uh, robotica in our future discussions as well. So very briefly from physical point of view. Thank you very much. I know that uh, you are also interested not to be just once <laughs> in the uh, industry day, but a partner uh, for the evolution of the project. So we we have we are in a period in which uh, I think uh, Real Baltica is a chance. It's an up to date project for climate change and for uh, this way we have to uh, uh, combine uh, the uh, climate and, and green targets uh, with the uh, economical efficiency. How do you see uh, this challenge? We have 10 minutes for <laughs> discussion on this very important topic, which is uh, so uh, present in the new regulation uh, of uh, on the European level. And of course, you spoke about jealousy, looking to Red Baltica. I must say, as coordinator, that sometimes uh, the uh, money which is given through the SEF um, uh, contribution is looked as a sort of privilege for the, the, the Baltic countries. So I always argue to say that, no, uh, we must see also from which point we, we, we uh, uh, conceive this project and to what, uh, to what uh, utility for all Europe, for all the network. It's not just for Baltic countries, it's a real added value for everyone, but we are in a specific territory. So that's why uh, this uh, vision of combining economical targets and uh, climate targets is uh, one of the key um, uh, elements of the discussion today. So I come back to you, Bente. What do you think? And perhaps you, you want to react to uh, what uh, other panelists said. Be free. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I uh, completely agree with you that Real Politica is a very uh, good opportunity to completely align with your Euro European standards. Um, and this is also quite a good investment opportunity um, when we look at the green bonds. Um, we had on behalf of our members discussions with the European Investment Bank, and they are really willing to help fund um, green initiatives so if you make sure that you are completely aligned with green initiatives it will be uh, easier to access european funding yeah. which is really good and to us the real bold cup project is a really um really important uh, project as well as the railway um, system in europe is has to see be seen as a whole not just um in different countries and you will be a very important link between Poland and between Finland. So all in all, it's very, very exciting. Thank you, Bente. And Marina, uh, can, you, can you come in? I will make a comment. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so yes, combining the economic and climate targets is quite a challenge. Uh, I'd like to, of course, make the reference to, to the uh, EU's uh, targets on the smart and sustainable mobility strategy, where uh, the commitment of, of um, boosting the model share to, to doubling the rail freight and tripling the high-speed rail traffic by 2030. Um, they're quite ambitious. So it is important here to really offer even greater reliability and quality to customers and uh, provide these interoperable and pragmatic solutions if we really want uh, rail to continue being uh, the backbone of a sustainable, a sustainable mobility system. Uh, so this is not an easy task and we're all aware of it. And Rail Baltica has great opportunity to really uh, 
show and demonstrate that this is quite possible. Of course, this requires investments, uh, robust and targeted investments wherever there is uh, market demand. Uh, but also, as I've mentioned already, this level playing field for sustainable rails, if we want to continue to offer these high quality services to, to uh, move um, the EU citizens and the uh, EU freight companies and shippers to rail. That also requires uh, from the sector uh, the commitment to continue applying digitalization and here the digital transformation of railways uh, will certainly contribute to making uh, them more efficient and sustainable. Uh, of course, uh, we need to uh, be aware that other transport modes are becoming increasingly digitalized and, and more and more sustainable. Uh, they're looking out for solutions on how to be uh, CO2 uh, emission free. So, so we need to look out and, and uh, really prove and support the Green Deal for railways. Thank you very much, Marina. Uh, this is, of course, uh, a big challenge, as you say, for, for, for Ray Baltica. But Okay, you, you could understand that uh, all the team uh, is also ready to, to take the challenge. Uh, Nick, uh, what, uh, how do you react to, to these interventions? Uh, well, I think the most important thing that we are looking for from Robotica, from the infrastructure, I mean, ultimately is an infrastructure manager, is, is the cost situation. How will it be done? Uh, what will the model be based on all the experiences that we've had from all of the rest of the Europe and all of our knowledge from the passenger rail industry? Um, what will it cost? The neutral, we, obviously we hope that it will be a neutral infrastructure manager, but will it be direct costs? Will it be marginal costs? How will the cost of using the infrastructure encourage new traffic, encourage new entrants, encourage competition? How will it compare to other modes of transport? I think Marina touched upon the comparison to yeah. road, of course, and most, yeah. and, and ultimately from a passenger rail perspective, the biggest, and I'm, I'm sure from freight as well, the biggest competitor is the private individual motor car for, for passenger trains, that is. Yeah. So how do we get I don't know, the 80% market share from the car, probably even higher in the Baltic states. How do we move that to passenger rail? So what will the cost model be? And um, but how can the, the system finance itself, of course? Um, will there have to be more government subsidy somehow to reduce the direct access cost? But I will say one thing. It's not as black and white as some people have implied in the past. If you have um, lower the track access costs, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's less revenue because you can lower track access costs and attract more traffic that way and actually earn more revenue than beforehand. Mm -hmm. So higher track access costs doesn't necessarily mean you get the highest amount of revenue. So you've got to th put that into the equation as well. And um, that, I mean, that will be the, the big question for us. It will succeed if there is a smart and digital and um, yeah, a low price track access uh, model for, for the infrastructure manager. Thank you. Thank you for reflections on the cost and the price. So, uh, Connor, uh, what do you want to add to this? Because uh, the cargo aspect is uh, very, very in the heart of the question. I'd like to build on a point Yanis made earlier about this is a region where it's, for freight anyway, it's been mostly focused on the west-east axis. We have to respect and understand that the dynamics of the north-south are going to be very different. The competition that's exposed to other modes of transport is much higher. We have road transport. We also have a lot of existing short sea shipping routes. Yeah. So for rail freight to be a success here, we need to be adopting a very different approach to what's been adopted in the east-west axis. It cannot just be a copy and paste. So here we need to be looking quite ambitiously at international timetabling, including with countries such as Poland and Germany to be able to connect the Baltic states with some core industrial hubs in central, central Europe, but we also need to be looking at access charges. At the end of the day, it needs to be financially competitive or the shipper is not going to go there. So again, I think the main thing we would call for is that we need this, have, uh, this different approach to the north-south axis to what we see today in the east-west axis. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's why uh, the uh, place of ports uh, is so important uh, and uh, the connection to uh, short sea shipping and the connection from port to rail. This is one of the key questions and the place uh, uh, of the terminals, the rail freight terminals is uh, also crucial and we work a lot on that. So, um, Simon, how do you react to what your colleagues said? Well, uh, yeah, yeah, interesting. <clears throat> and I just wanted to, excuse me one second. <clears throat> Beg your pardon. <clears throat> I just wanted to, um, 
just to just to develop us a little bit the the point that Connor was just making because um, one of the, and, and he's absolutely right when he says that this cannot be a cut and paste or a carbon copy of the West East. I mean, it won't be for a start because West East is on the fifteen twenty gauge, whereas North South is going to be on the URC gauge. But it's it. But equal, equally, equally, it, it has shown in the past. Um, and Nick touched on it earlier when he was talking about the the Italian the Italian high speed rail traffic. Is that if you actually put into the marketplace a new product, and we've seen this happen on a number of occasions. Uh, not only in the passenger domain but also in the freight domain. If you put if you put a new a new product on the marketplace and you actually do make it attractive, and of course it has to be attractive. The trains have to run at the right time, and it has to be, as Connor said, it has to be at the right price. Um, it means that you will attract. I mean, you you will attract new business, business that perhaps you didn't even know was there, because maybe today there is a shipper who takes his takes his his load uh, via the short sea route. Um, from from A to B, whereas tomorrow with the with the railway line, they might say, actually, I can do this a lot quicker. It's going to be a lot cleaner because it's electric traction, and it's a lot quicker because it can do it in a day, whereas the boat takes three. For example, I mean, I'm, I don't have any worked examples of that, but uh, I think one of the things that is, is that with the with the with the emergence of the new opportunities, it it itself grows. Um, a new type of market. The example, there's an, a very good example in France um, when the high speed line was built between Lille and Paris, um, pre pandemic, of course. I mean, let's not go into the pandemic situation, but pre pandemic, there were trains at certain times of the day every 30 minutes between Lille and Paris. Uh, because the market was there and people were using it because it was it was an hour from Paris to Lille. So people were moving out of Paris and living in Lille and commuting in every day. And I am certain that if you have a, a good, reliable, clean, efficient, uh, frequent um, uh, service on a new railway line that is serving maybe towns that don't even exist now or are only villages but will grow, I mean, Nick will remember from his from his UK railway history about places like Crewe, which developed uh, from a small village into a huge town because the railway came. Um, but it's but it's it, that that is the kind of advantage or the kind of the kind of potential that Railbotica has got, I think, to grow uh, the the this and it's it just goes back to the first question about the social socio economic benefits as well. And I believe that there is some um, significant opportunity. Thank you, Simon. The last word is to is given to Yanis. So uh, perhaps you can conclude this uh, discussion with the colleagues of the panel. Yeah, thank you. Just just very quickly from our side as well, as you rightly pointed out previously, that we are looking uh, at, uh, we, we are trying to be a long term partner, a constant long term partner for 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 different government agencies for different projects. So we're certainly looking at this cost benefit uh, aspect and I cannot reiterate probably more than it has already been reiterated. But one thing I want to mention here is that since we are Foreign Investors Council in Latvia, we obviously have many members that are part of larger international groups. So we are actually sometimes sharing some, some, some valid international experience and also sharing it with the public institutions. So maybe this is one of the aspects where we can actually share and come to some some uh, some viable and, uh, and 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 practical ideas. So, trying to conclude on a positive note here. Thank you very much to all the panelists, uh, dear participants. You saw that uh, they came from different places in Europe. It's a real European and international uh, panel. So, I will thank you uh, really profoundly because uh, this was very interesting. Messages for governments, messages for the Commission, messages. Uh, messages for the uh, uh, RB Rail and for the implementing bodies. So, Kaspers, I uh, give you the, the, the floor now uh, for the next step of, uh, of the day. And thank you to all. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, thanks, Catherine. But I won't let you away quite yet. Uh, let, let us take at least one question. There are quite a few questions on, okay. on Slido. But let's just take one, the most, most popular one that on, on the top. So, and I, I'm sure that everyone on the panel can, can chip in on this one. 
Is there a fifth railway package approaching that would facilitate joint infra management for projects like Rail Baltica? I can say a few words there, I guess. Um, fifth railway package, no. I think we have a good legal framework in place in the fourth railway package. What we do see and what will come, though, is a re reworking of how we manage capacity today, to put it at a more international level. So fifth railway package, no, but that doesn't mean the way we work today is going to stay the same. I, I would, can I, can I say something now? I would also generally agree with Connor. Um, the fourth worry package has to be implemented. Um, there's a lot mm. of work to do on that. If it is implemented, then we can go a long way with Rail Baltica. It's not perfect, the fourth worry package. There is more to do, but um, probably not enough to justify a fifth railway package yet. Yes, I wanted to ask if it was a recommendation or a nightmare. <laughs> because, P -p -p you know, as a question. we need sometimes yeah. also. <laughs> so I saw Bente who wanted to say something at the end of uh, the panel. No, Bente, you wanted to add something? Uh, yes, I wanted to draw some attention to the revision of the 10T networks, which we are really looking forward to, and it is due on December 14th. So indeed, it's not a real, whole new railway package, but it may be something to definitely look forward to. And we also have some exciting initiatives such as Eurolink, which if you become a member as well, um, may really help Real Vodka as well in giving international rail traffic uh, a worthy place uh, on the railways. Thank you. If I may, just also some uh, last words from my side. I agree with everything that the panelists just said, and uh, we do not need a fifth railway package. We have more packages to come on the way uh, for the efficient and mobility package, like uh, Bente just mentioned, including the 10T revision, but also uh, some exciting proposals by the end of next year and the year afterwards. And indeed, we do hope to see um, uh, a legal uh, basis on the international timetabling, but not by reopening uh, the single European area directive.